so uh, welcome everyone and i'm uh, i'm absolutely uh, astonished that you decided to uh, take part in this conference because uh, not only uh, is it helpful uh, which all of you confirmed but it also a true game changer and i think these are these kind of moments that we should share even more and more and basically collaborate um, so I invite you to this uh, short, however, hopefully very informative journey. Uh, let me start by telling you a few rules. Uh, I highly invite you to practice as much as you can, because today we are going to practice together. A Q&A session will happen to all of us at the end. So if you have some questions, concerns, or maybe any thoughts, please feel to share them uh, and uh, feel free to use chat to ask uh, and answer. A few, a few topics for our discussion. Um, we are going to start by discussing very important brain regions. I'll try to oversimplify it a bit for you and not use too much of scientific language to make everything more digestible. Uh, we will focus on understanding meditation and I will show you a few ways how you and your learners can meditate and uh, why mindfulness and meditation is uh, specifically helpful in educational environment not only, so to speak. Uh, we will have practical session, as I mentioned at the beginning, and at the very end, I will debunk few meditation myths. So I hope that you are all ready. So uh, let's start. Uh, first things first, uh, as Mohammed already mentioned, I'm uh, very happy to be a part of EDUCAST. I'm mindfulness practitioner, soon to be teacher. I'm a cognitive neuroscience student and neuropsychology and neurobiology researcher. Delta qualified teacher, teacher trainer, which is always a pleasure to share uh, my knowledge because at the same time, I also learn from other trainees. And I'm business, uh, business English teacher. So to speak, let's begin and uh, let me break down a few important regions uh, of our brain uh, to help you to visualize and understand certain processes that are happening when we considering meditation and when we actually do meditate. Uh, starting by with left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So this is this region in your brain that is situated here. Yeah. Imagine your brain as a control center, you know, like with different areas that are responsible for different tasks. So uh, it's like the boss in charge of planning, organizing, and making decisions. Uh, this area, uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, is the area that is absolutely significant for all sorts of higher level thinking and problem solving. Uh, and few things that this region is responsible for uh, are working memory. So this is like your mental sticky notepad, which allows you to remember important stuff while you are doing other things. It's also responsible for cognitive flexibility. So for instance, uh, if you um, are thinking outside the box, it will help you to switch gears, you know, adapt to new situations and hopefully come up with very creative solutions to certain problems. Uh, and it's uh, important for decision-making. So it helps you to consider some factors like risks, rewards, uh, and maybe consequences just to guide you toward the best outcome. Next part of our brain that it's necessary when we speak about meditation is ACC, which stands for anterior cingulate cortex. And now try to think about your brain as a super highway with different lanes for different tasks. And ACC is like your special lane that helps your brain to manage and, you know, juggle lots of important things at once. One of many things that ACC does is it helps you pay attention and stay focused. You know, this is like the traffic cop of your brain, which directs your attention to what's most important and help you to ignore distractions. So uh, I guess we all had such situation that we were studying for some test or basically we were studying for pleasure as Joe uh, mentioned, uh, which uh, never ends and uh, hopefully will never end for everyone, especially in educational field. So when you are studying for uh, any material or for any test, you are able to block some background noise, or for instance, you can ignore your phone buzzing. 
And this is exactly thanks to ACC because it helps you to keep on track. Additionally, ACC um, plays a huge uh, role in how you process emotions. So it helps you recognize and respond to some feelings like sadness, fear, happiness. Uh, and uh, basically when something makes you feel excited or maybe nervous, the ACC is exactly the part that is helping your brain to figure out how to react to the situation. Uh, additionally, it's also involved in decision making. So when you are trying to decide whether to study, you know, for more hour or maybe two or three, um, ACC is helping you to decide um, uh, and weigh pros and cons. So in a nutshell, ACC is your brain's multitasking master. The next part, uh, which has a very interesting name, it's insula. And this is absolutely fascinating part of your brain, uh, which is hidden deep inside. So this is kind of like hidden gem. Uh, and um, it plays super important role in how you experience all the world around you. Yeah. So we can think of insula as your brain's internal compass for your whole body. This is your control center that helps you to understand, sense what's going on inside of you. So for instance, when you are feeling hungry, thirsty, or even in pain, uh, this region in the brain is going to help you to uh, register those sensations. But that's not all. Uh, insula also is... Um, involved in your emotional experiences. So it also helps you to process feelings like sadness, disgust, uh, fear. Uh, and imagine the situation when a um, particular uh, experience gives you this um, fuzzies or makes you cringe. Yeah, The insula is here all the time and is helping your brain to make sense of these emotions. In a nutshell, um, the insula is your personal detective for all things, internal sensations, emotions, even empathy. And it's crucial part of how you personally experience the world and how you connect with others, even uh, if you don't realize that it's happening. When we think about mindfulness and any kind of meditation, um, ultimate question to begin with, um, and this is the division that I would like to start, is interoception or exteroception. This, these are two areas that um, much often are not considered. So I came across uh, feedback that meditation or mindfulness wasn't helpful in particular situations that some students or people deciding to meditate found themselves in uncomfortable situation. Uh, there is um, some idea that it might be due to not considering the differences between interoception and exteroception. Uh, what's that? Uh, simply speaking, interoception, uh, this is uh, like insight. So interoception is involved uh, in sensing signals uh, from within the body, you know, your perception of what's inside your body, heartbeat, uh, your breathing, uh, whether you are hungry or thirsty, or even temperature regulation. And exteroception is like the, the outside. So this is perception of what's outside your skin. And this is the process of receiving and constantly interpreting information from external world. Like our brain is doing it all the time, even if you don't notice that. Uh, and this interpretation can happen through sensory organs, like your eyes, your ears, your nose, skin, and even tongue why it's uh, significant to mention because when you close your eyes uh, you slow down but in what way you do slow down uh, the majority of perception shifts into interoception and b believe me like the, uh, the the research shows and the mri scan shows that um, this is massive shift massive shift um, some people, some regular practitioners can even estimate their heartbeat by only focusing on interoception, closing eyes, for instance. Mm. 
However, as you know, uh, nature loves balance and uh, there should be happy medium in everything we do. That's why there is also some connection between high level of stress and anxiety uh, and high level of interoception. So basically, if you think too much what's happening in your head, inside your body, um, you take the risk of uh, being kind of anxious, which might lead to the association. Uh, which in fact, it's um, it cannot be labeled as something bad or good. The, the association or dissociation per se uh, can be beneficial as well. It might be related to some traumatic events, uh, to some accidents, and this is uh, also a natural response of your nervous system. Uh, that's why... Um, uh, some people uh, opt for meditation of more interoceptive awareness, uh, some for extraceptive. Extraceptive, for instance, you walk, uh, you focus on something that's placed outside, uh, and basically you bring your attention towards something outside. And I would say a majority of people um, is uh, both. Depending on certain circumstances, situations, uh, events, or even the atmosphere, people that are around you, we might be both, we might switch between these states. That's why when we think about mindfulness and meditation, um, the first question to consider is, are you a person who is in touch with your body sensations? When we think on average, do you, do, do you tend to do it more uh, or maybe less? Yeah. Uh, uh, as I said, it highly depends on certain circumstances. For instance, you might wake up in the morning and feel more interoceptive. Yeah. So like you think what's going on in your head, you need to pay bills, you're going to call your friend, you need to, uh, to deal with uh, red tape things like that, or uh, like after a very intensive day working with students, with other people, with clients, uh, you might find yourself very extraceptive. So like thinking what's outside, yeah, light, sound, noises, and everything what's going on outside. And meditation, um, this is the, uh, the situation when we think from scientific perspective, um, to adjust your place, simply speaking, considering interoception and extraception. And why it's essential? Because um, uh, from scientific perspective, you would, uh, um, you would rather go, and it's advisable to enhance and go against your default mode network, yeah? So if you tend to be more in your mind, in your body, it's advisable to do the opposite, to practice the opposite, because you want to anchor your attention, simply speaking, and um, do something which is less easily, because only then uh, you enhance neuroplasticity. Uh, we know from uh, linguistic studies, linguistic research, MRI scans, that um, there also uh, needs to be certain level of salience, balance, the task cannot be too uh, overwhelming, too difficult. However, it cannot be too easy as well. So uh, when you deliberately focus on more challenging state, yes, to create certain balance, yes, this is a situation that's immensely beneficial for you. Because to sum it up, when it's easy, no neural circuits are working in your brain. Moving on, uh, why uh, it's uh, absolutely essential to mention, def to mention a default mode network when we consider meditation and mindfulness, because this practice, these practices, there are many, uh, can help you to balance your default mode, mode network. And what kind of network is that? Imagine your brain as a super complex network of highways, yeah? And information travels on each of this path. And DMN is your special VIP road that your brain takes when you are not focused on anything specific. What it means, this is special VIP road that when you, uh, when you are daydreaming, when you are letting your mind wander or simply chill out, default mode network is kicking into gear. So this is like your brain's default mode. Um, your brain is not actively engaged in any particular task, but 
interestingly, even though you might feel like you are not doing anything specific, your brain is actually working pretty hard. And DMN is involved in all sorts of important mental processes. Uh, so you can imagine it like uh, some backstage crew, you know, like Madonna crew that Madonna is on the tour. So the crew is working on backstage just to deliver outstanding performance. And DMN is working behind the scenes to help you to make any sense of the world. So for instance, um, it's responsible for uh, reflecting on your past experiences and memories. Yeah? So we get back to the past. Or thinking about the future and planning ahead uh, and understanding your own thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and kind of state that you can find yourself in. Uh, then... Uh, smoothly, uh, we go to the area that is absolutely essential uh, for any kind of activity. It doesn't have to be um, motorcycle, uh, uh, I mean muscle cycle activity. It can be also when you sit. I'm also talking about breathing here, uh, which I mentioned a few times before. There are several patterns of breathing. Uh, for instance, you might have heard about um, Wim Hof breathing. So this is like cyclic hyperventilation. So like, yeah, so just to visualize it, yes, it was, uh, show you. So it's like hyperventilation that generates adrenaline. It can heat up your body. Um, there's also breathing pattern of slow cyclic breathing, box breathing, uh, many of them. Today, we are not going to dive deeper into breathing per se, but um, uh, how we should breathe during meditation, if you decide to give it a try, or um, maybe invite your students or clients to try it out. Again, we begin with ultimate question. First, we consider interoception or extraception. Yes, are you uh, more in your head or you're focusing on the outside? And then we go with the question, uh, which uh, state you would like to exit your meditation practice? Would you rather be more relaxed after a long, hard day? Or maybe you would like to be more alert? What we do know from respiration physiology uh, is that if you would like to be more alert, your inhales should be longer and more vigorous than exhales. Yeah, like because it releases, for, for instance, noradrenaline. On the other hand, if you would like to exit your meditation practice or any kind of uh, mindfulness activity, uh, being calm and relaxed, uh, you should focus on longer duration and vigorous exhales than inhales, yeah? So this exhale, exhaling is definitely longer because uh, you will end up having lots of air in your lungs and diaphragm. Uh, so this is what needs to be considered because very often people are not aware that uh, uh, breathing is more essential and it can create certain, it's it's like the a snowball effect. It's interconnected with uh, many organs and with regions of our brain. Uh, one thing that I wanted to, to share with you, it's an absolutely mind-blowing study by Killsworth and Gilbert um, of, of ha Harvard University, which is called uh, A Wandering Mind is Unhappy Mind. And why is that? Um, we will skip the part of protocols and the methods that were used to measure certain elements. Um, I will skip to uh, directly to uh, the conclusion of the study. Uh, it stands that uh, individuals tend to report a lower level of happiness, lower, and higher level of unhappiness when their minds were wandering compared to the situation when they were extremely focused on the present moment. And the researchers found that people's minds wander frequently. You cannot stop it, simply speaking. Approximately, it's like 47% of your waking hours spent in mind wandering. So that's a lot. 
Furthermore, the researchers observed that uh, mind wandering was associated with lower level of happiness, um, regardless of the activity that uh, individual uh, was engaged in at the time. Um, that being said, the study suggests that the tendency of our minds to wander away from present moment, to past, to future, and make rounds and basically have fun, this is like wild party, is linked, is directly linked to lower subjective well-being. And that's why uh, they also highlight the importance of mindfulness and the present moment awareness in promoting happiness, in considering language acquisition, helping your working memory, and so on. And um, how we can understand meditation, um, simply speaking, um, this is the practice of being fully present and engaged. Uh, we try to not judge what's happening because there will be always something that's happening in our minds, feelings, some sensations, we can uh, experience the environment around us. We try to not judge it. Uh, imagine your mind, uh, to be a kind of monkey, but monkey in Amazon forest, you know, like vast territory, uh, monkey hopping from one tree to another, uh, catching some fruit from one branch to another. And there is also constant struggle to find valuable food resources and so on. So this is exactly what your mind is doing. And to debunk this concept that Hmm, I think like meditation and mindfulness is not for me because I simply cannot stop and not think about anything, nothing. Um, uh, let me help you. Um, it's not about it because you, uh, you won't be uh, able to stop your mind. Refocusing practice. This is the valuable uh, moment um, from scientific perspective uh, that is helping you to develop because the more you hop away and back, the better. So basically you are focusing on your breath and you observe that, hmm, again, I'm thinking about my students. This student was very disruptive and I'm very angry because of him. And tomorrow I have another lesson with the student, what I'm going to do. And then you breathe in and out, you refocus and you gently get back to your breath. And this is the moment when neuroplasticity and when your, when your brain is actually developing. Uh, because uh, mindfulness meditation involves uh, the interaction and harmony between, between your central nervous system in your brain and autonomic nervous system, so your body. Because your body uh, and all the unconscious activities like breathing, digestion, um, you cannot control it. It's just happening. Uh, as I mentioned, in meditation, we try to adjust our place considering interoception and, and exteroception. Uh, and uh, we we obviously uh, uh, maybe you uh, you heard uh, it's it's very obvious to me maybe it is for you uh, that meditation has been with us for centuries. Uh, some meditational practices are directly linked to, for instance, Buddhist meditation practices. However, not all of them. Uh, and um, we try to develop our mindset in this way of uh, new kid. So like your, uh, your approach and like your observations are very new. So you are trying to be curious and non-judgmental. And when we think about mindfulness per se, uh, one prominent figure that uh, I cannot uh, mention uh, and I wouldn't uh, do that to you, is John Kabat-Zinn. Uh, he played significant role in popularizing mindfulness-based practices in modern context. Uh, the program uh, which uh, he is the founder of, uh, Mindfulness-Based based Stress Reduction, this is the program that uh, was found in uh, late 70s. And this is evidence-based intervention um, that integrates mindfulness meditation and, for instance, yoga with principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. 
Originally developed at the University of Massachusetts a Medical School, uh, the aim was to help individuals to cope with chronic pain and stress-related conditions. Additionally, John Kabat-Zinn is a molecular biologist and has a background in mindfulness meditation. If you would like to dive deeper into this uh, tremendous amount of knowledge and research, uh, I highly recommend two books by John Kabat-Zinn, Full Catastrophe Living, and Wherever You Go, There You Are. Uh, and here we are closely coming to uh, the moment of uh, why and how uh, mindfulness can be used in education. Uh, first, let's begin with um, uh, why it's very helpful, because um, in education, you can, you as a teacher and with director of studies, um, you can include simple techniques like mindful breathing, or more structured activities such as guided meditations, uh, and they uh, can help you to, to integrate whole curriculum. For instance, you can uh, incorporate mindful observations in science classes, you know, doing some kind of uh, crazy uh, experiments related to chemistry and teach uh, students how to observe what's going on. Um, or maybe you would like to focus on communication. So through teaching mindful listening, you might help uh, in evolving uh, such soft skills. Cannot be overstated, I would say. Uh, teacher training, it's, uh, it's this territory that um, I highly recommend you to explore. I guess we all found ourselves in the situation um, while working with young learners or adults, for instance. Mm, uh, someone got really disruptive. And you observe the situation and you are thinking, um, holy moly, I've spent so much time uh, on creating certain lesson. Yeah, I would like to deliver this knowledge in the very best I can. Yeah, like everyone is so involved. Everyone is willing to learn. And this one particular student is, is trying to destroy that, simply speaking. Yeah. And of course, you are evaluating uh, your past. You know that the student has this tendency to do so. <clears throat> and you are uh, uh, immediately thinking about the future. Yeah. Okay. I have to react and do this and that. I have to protect other kids. I cannot let the student destroy my session. Obviously, from one perspective, this is uh, your very natural and evolutionary response. However, it might be... Um, uh, packed with uh, certain stereotypes and uh, even cognitive bias because you can predict to some extent what can happen but you never know if that's going to be the truth so at this very moment when you feel that you are boiling yes and you see the student that is actually destroying uh, the whole class you can take a few deep uh, breaths yeah admit that this is the state that you currently are in and maybe turn into the direction of asking why, being curious, why the student again is trying to destroy the whole class. Of course, uh, it doesn't come easily. Yeah, uh, no, no easy solutions here. It takes practice and there might be a day when you find yourself uh, very uh, flexible to to react in this way yes to allow yourself to breathe and maybe another time not at all we try to not judge ourselves as well and in education uh, and in terms of benefits um, research suggests that mindfulness practices in education can enhance cognitive functions such as memory, executive function, and attention. This is the, the research, for instance, by Zelazo and Lyons, 2012. Um, med meditation and mindfulness is absolutely helpful in emotional regulation and social emotional learning. Uh, so these interventions can help students to develop um, greater emotional uh, regulation skills and even reduce symptoms of anxiety and depression. Now, I'll give you uh, a moment to, uh, to process everything. Uh, and I'm inviting you to the practice that you can easily take 
and uh, simply copy and paste in your classroom or if you uh, would like to meditate on your own. We spoke about interoception and one of the methods that is uh, absolutely mind-blowing and is found to be uh, beneficial according to MRI scans as well uh, is called body scan meditation. That's why um, I guess that you are sitting. Uh, if you are sitting, feel free to do so. Uh, you can even lay down. That's your decision. Just find comfortable space for you. And let's do it together. Mm, I would like you to close your eyes and bring attention to your breath for some moment. Grounding yourself in the present moment and just observing your breath, how the air comes through your nose, for instance, how it goes away, how you exhale. Yeah. Keep your eyes closed and start by focusing on your feet. Yeah. Still, still breathing, bring attention to your feet and notice, is there any sensation? Yeah? Is there any sensation, for instance, like a tension in your feet? Yeah? Allow yourself to get back to breathing once you notice that your mind is wandering somewhere else. It's very natural. Then slowly... Uh, by bringing your attention to the upper part of your body, think about any sensation in your knees. Maybe there is there is some warmth, that, or maybe there is some uh, relaxation you can feel. Mm -hmm. Avoid any judgment. Remember about breathing and simply observe the sensation. Just admit that this is what you are feeling and slowly, gradually move to your hips, to your pelvis, to your lower back. If you are sitting, you can try to feel when exact, where exactly you will get the feeling of your pelvis and hips. Are they relaxed? Remember about inhales and exhales. Once should remember. Mm -hmm. And spend just some moment there, slowly moving to your chest and keeping your eyes closed. Can you notice any sensation in your chest? Maybe you can even hear your heart beating. What's happening if you take very deep breath and when you slowly exhale? Allow yourself to focus on the neck, on your head, do you feel the temperature or maybe any other sensation? Maybe there is a difference in tension when you think about your right shoulder or left shoulder. Remember to breathe and breathe out, breathe in and breathe out. And give yourself some moment to stay with yourself, focusing on your breath. And whenever you feel, you feel ready, you can open your eyes and gently uh, bring awareness and look what's going on around you. If you feel like doing so, uh, you can also share your thoughts or sensations on the chat. We have some moment for that. If you wish to 
keep it to yourself only. Feel free to do so. I will wrap up by stating the purpose. Um, this body scan meditation helps um, develop a heightened awareness of your bodily sensations. It can promote a stronger connection with your internal state. You can also transfer it um, and not do body scan. For instance, if you work with young learners, you can um, uh, help them to visualize balloon. Yeah, And this technique is called balloon breath. Uh, we don't have to, uh, time to do it together today because I also wanted to show you how exteroception practice can work. However, in terms of interoception, our inside balloon breath are found to be very simple uh, yet beneficial method because I, I guess most of kids love balloons so it's very easy for them to visualize that they have certain space in their belly which can uh, which can look like a balloon and due to several um, inhales and exhales uh, they can observe what's going on with this balloon As I mentioned, uh, we do have time uh, for extra reception practice together. Uh, if you find yourself the, the person who is uh, an overthinker, uh, or there are several moments in your day or after specific events, uh, all right, I will respond to, uh, to the chat. Thank you, Fiona, for sharing the feedback, you experience mild tension and pain on your right shoulder. Okay, okay, yes. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, let's all together um, think and at the same time feel and experience what can happen um, or maybe nothing will happen. That's also okay. We are not uh, judging. When we shift our awareness and focus, outside our body uh, i'm inviting you to mindful observation meditation right now um, we are going to engage in mindful observation of your surrounding uh, so again we are finding comfortable space to sit however after so many hours of educast conference if you would like to stand or even walk Feel free to do so. Um, and again. Uh, In fact, I really need this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, Mohammed, exactly. I, I think this is and uh, th this is a great idea. Um, for instance, as a break in your classroom after several several hours uh, in primary school or in high school at the university, you can help your student to stretch for a moment and simply to uh, to move because we know uh, motion is lotion. Uh, we were uh, designed, we, we evolved to be in constant motion. So uh, uh, let's find some uh, comfortable space and body position for each of you. I would like you to take a few deep breaths and slowly, gently, Center yourself in the present moment, here, now. Mm. You can close your eyes if you want and observe how you inhale and exhale. Maybe you can notice that you feel more sensation when you inhale than when you exhale or the opposite. That's completely fine. We allow our body to do what's very natural. Gently open your eyes. Look around. Don't rush. And focus on a specific object that's pretty close to you, that you can see and is nearby. Don't forget to breathe in and out. If you feel like you need to breathe deeper, go for it. And once you choose the object you would like to focus on, observe the details. Can you think 
of any details you see. Allow your awareness to expand. Remember to breathe in and out. Mm. Can you think about color of the object you are looking at? Maybe there, there are different shades of color. Is there any shape? What kind of shape you see? Can you think about any texture of the object that you are looking at without labeling it, thinking if it's good or bad, just observing? When you gently help your mind to get back to present moment and breathe in and out, can you notice any sounds? Maybe something outside the place you are currently in or maybe inside the room? Can you spot any tactile sensations? Or maybe when you slowly breathe in and out, you can notice any smell. If your mind starts to wander, that's okay. Gently bringing back to the present moment. Allow yourself to take a few deep breaths in your natural pace. Don't rush. And I will wrap up this short exteroception practice by stating the purpose. This meditation can uh, enhance an exteroception by sharpening your awareness of external stimuli. It can also promote a deeper con uh, connection with your surrounding. You can do the same when you go with your students or alone, for instance, uh, to the forest. Then uh, we would call it, for instance, not nature exploration. You can think about a tree that's in front of you, or you can simply think about any kind of uh, object that's around you. Is there any feedback, any thoughts that someone wishes to share on the chat. If not, if you decide to keep it for you, that's okay. Yeah, so everyone was looking uh, forward to seeing your feedback in the chat box. Uh -huh. Okay. I saw water taking spiral shape when looking at image. Wow, burning sensation in the belly. That's so interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Fiona. Slowly moving. Um, uh, five senses. This is another proposal that uh, you can try with your students and with uh, yourself. Five senses. Of course, it's exteroception. You can simply ask your students what they see. Is there something they hear, feel? And then uh, sitting in circle, you can uh, give yourself free, maybe five minutes to process and then to uh, discuss uh, and compare any findings. Slowly, uh, I hope that uh, you had a chance to breathe in and out and it made you comfortable. I will debunk a few meditation myths as you all experienced, uh, it's a huge myth that you need more than 30 minutes or even one hour or whole, whole day to meditate. When it comes to research and um, on average uh, time uh, that uh, one can spend um, while beginning this journey, uh, three to five minutes is absolutely great for the start. Uh, there will be some days that five minutes might be too much for you, or maybe you will find yourself in the position that after five minutes, you stopped counting the time and uh, you simply went uh, even longer. Uh, mind silence is a goal uh, uh, to 
um, exaggerate this one one more time. Uh, it's totally uh, not true because your mind will never be perfectly silent. We are just trying to help your mind to be more flexible in terms of getting back to the present moment. However, we do remember that mind is a giant monkey or name any kind of animal that visual that you would visualize as uh, this jumping, hectic, uh, disruptive species. Uh, when it comes to uh, some misinformation, I already told you that meditation and mindfulness uh, doesn't, uh, meditation per se, doesn't have to be uh, connected to any religious practice. Mindfulness is uh, simply uh, a practice that uh, doesn't involve any kind of religion. Uh, you don't have to sit still. You can walk around. Maybe after the whole conference, you decide to go for a walk and give yourself three minutes to observe what you see. When uh, you have, for instance, uh, a dog, you can observe your dog, what's going on with your dog. And there are many ways to meditate. Uh, today, we were uh, trying a guided meditation, focusing on interoception and exteroception. However, uh, you can try yoga, uh, yoga nidra. If you are a fan of gentle martial arts, uh, Qigong is also a great uh, way to meditate in motion and uh, scientifically proven non-sleep depressed, which is amazing technique to uh, restart your brain, uh, oversimplifying, of course, restart your brain. And helping meditation work for you uh, for the end of the session, a few things and ideas from my side. Uh, you can choose, for instance, one activity you can focus on. Uh, for instance, I love brewing tea. Uh, so I would give myself three to five minutes to observe, trying to be uh, in the present moment looking at the kettle, uh, the pot, uh, how I pour water, what's going on, what colors uh, and uh, smells are around me when I fill my cup with the water. Um, you can try slow down to, tr to slow down your eating, trying to have this mind of uh, keto and few bunches a uh, bunch of ideas. Be patient. You embark on a journey if you decide so, uh, and it's a journey. It's a never-ending journey. Just trust yourself and the process. Uh, some days the effects will be more visible than the other days, and that's completely fine. That's a very natural process because uh, your mind, as we do know, is absolutely bombarded by stimuli and tons of information every day. Uh, thank you very much for spending this uh, Saturday afternoon with me and with Educast. If you have any other questions you would like to get more about, get to know more about mindfulness, meditation, cognitive neuroscience, uh, don't hesitate to message me. And uh, in our special interest group in Educast, we are going to have set of uh, neuroscience in education events. So basically, feel free to join us anytime from everywhere. So thank you so much.